first time in U.S. history, a serial killer is scheduled to be released from a Texas prison. There's no doubt in my mind that he's going to resume his career, and that career is randomly killing women. I feel threatened by the fact that he will kill again, for sure. I was scared to death that he was going to get out on the street because nobody's going to know where he is until the bodies start turning up. A clever and elusive serial killer, Coral Eugene Watts, admitted murderer of 13 women, could soon see the light of day. Mentally, you're thinking, Texas isn't going to let a serial killer out of prison. That's not going to happen. Somebody's going to do something. But nobody did. see a murder every day. You don't get to see the person that killed the person every day. It's engraved. It is welded. It is chiseled in my mind. On a cold December night, Joe Foy hears something in the alley behind his home. <laughs> I had seen a black male and a white female standing. The woman had her back against the wall, and the male was standing in front of her, and he was moving around. I seen the man bring his arm up and bring it down in a slashing motion. The woman fell to the ground. I yelled into the house, call the police, call the police. The man walks toward him. We just locked the lances. His eyes were just dark, like nothing had just happened. His walk, his act was just so callous and cold and evil. He opened his car door, just pulled off and went on his merry way like nothing had happened. Ferndale police identify the victim as 36-year-old Helen Dutcher. She's been stabbed 12 times. The clothing that she had on was eventually looked at where they had stab wounds that would line up for where she was stabbed and sliced on her body. Foy tells police that the suspect drove away in a tan Pontiac. He also helps police come up with a composite sketch of the killer. But the investigation leads nowhere. I had called them quite a few times to say, hey, got anything going on with it, anything happening? And both three, four times it was, no, nah, there's nothing. We haven't found anything. A few months earlier, Detroit news reporter Gene Klein is stabbed to death in a similar assault that left no clues. The Detroit cases go cold. Then, 25 miles away in the college town of Ann Arbor, 17-year-old Shirley Small is stabbed to death while walking home. Three months later, 20-year-old Glenda Richmond is found murdered inside her apartment complex. And two months after that, 20-year-old Rebecca Huff becomes the third Ann Arbor victim. This was the apartment house that Rebecca Greer Huff lived in. Uh, this is where she had parked her car and was walking down here when she was attacked and murdered. Her wounds were all central to the front of her chest. There were 54. Looked like she had been attacked from behind and stabbed. 
In all the cases, the wounds appear to have been made by a screwdriver. We had three homicides uh, over a uh, five-month period, all happening uh, early in the morning hours, all on uh, Saturday night, early Sunday morning, and all young women. Uh, they were all accosted and stabbed and left right where they had been uh, uh, assaulted. That was very, very unusual for Ann Arbor. None of the women were raped or robbed. The killer is meticulous, leaving behind no evidence and no witnesses. These are well-populated apartment complexes. You knock on every door, nobody saw anything, heard nobody heard anything. It's very frustrating. By now, police know they have a serial killer on their hands. Forensic psychologist Harley Stock joins the investigation. Almost all serial killers uh, that we knew about in the early 80s were white. They said he'd be between about 22 and 31, that he would have somewhat limited intelligence. If he was married, it would have been for a relatively short period of time because of poor relationships with women. A 15-member special task force begins searching for leads. Months go by. Then, a tip from a Detroit police officer points to a suspect. I was reading the Detroit News. They had a story in there that stated that the uh, victims were stabbed with a screwdriver. I immediately knew that it wasn't a screwdriver, that it was a wood carving tool. Six years earlier, Arthurs had investigated the stabbing death of Gloria Steele, a 19-year-old student in Kalamazoo, just 90 miles from Ann Arbor. He stabbed Gloria Steele so hard in the chest with this wood carving tool that it embedded in her spine and had to be chiseled out by the medical examiner. The prime suspect was a fellow student named Coral Eugene Watts. At the time, Arthur searched Watts's home in Detroit. We went to the address, and there were several wood carvings in that home. We did recover some uh, wood carving tools. But there was never enough evidence to arrest Watts. Now, Arthur's is convinced the latest murders are the work of the same man. He contacts Ann Arbor police. At first, they didn't believe me. They didn't think it was him. I continued to call them several times. I spoke with, uh, in, with the chief of police first and then with uh, Paul Bunton. We drove to Kalamazoo to look at their case. It just struck us immediately. The wounds were almost identical to Rebecca Huff's. Kalamazoo knew that he was very probably their murderer, but they could not prove that case. Very frustrating for them. This really struck us as a good suspect, so we started spending all of our time just working on Coral Eugene Watts. The more we worked on him, the better he looked as a suspect. had eluded Ann Arbor police. They suspect he's killed at least three young women in their town. Watts has a violent history. By age 15, he was assaulting women. When he was very young, he told a psychiatrist that he just did it because it made him feel good. As a 15-year-old, uh, he realized that people could identify his face. He evolved, and he started attacking women from behind and dropping them where they stood so they could never see his face. He 
he actually lived in the city of Detroit. We found out where he worked. We found out a whole lot of information. But it was during this heightened investigation where we uh, put out information about his car and everything to, to all of the officers. We were in the uh, central campus area, 4.40 in the morning. We saw a young woman walking down the street. She was very careful to look about her. It wasn't like she was out just for a casual walk. She appeared to be trying to make herself aware of, of her surroundings. They see a tan Pontiac driving back and forth. We thought he was stalking her. We knew he was interested in her, at least in our minds. We were sure that he was interested in her. After a few minutes, the woman disappears from the street. But the car keeps prowling. The supposition was he was hunting, and he'd lost sight of his quarry. Police call into dispatch. We heard Don Terry call on the radio with a license number, and that the guy looked like he was going to run. He wasn't going to stop. I heard the license number, and I knew that license number right away. It's Coral Watts. Police arrest him for driving with a suspended license and expired plates. This incident was the first time that anybody had been able to place Watts in Ann Arbor, even though he'd been on a suspect list. I knew that this was our guy. I knew very well it was. Okay, what's your date of birth, Carl? What really tipped me off is when I talked to him, he was very cordial. I sat in the interview room with him, uh, talked with him. He told me where he was, where he was going. As soon as I got crime specific, he immediately said, I want to see an attorney. He was released. We didn't have enough to hold him. We did search his car, and we took some evidence out of his car, nothing that proved to be evidence from our victim. But Ann Arbor police keep Watts in their sights around the clock. I worked midnight shift on the surveillance. He didn't move a lot on midnights, but we uh, got a search warrant for a tracking device for his car. He was very difficult to follow. He didn't do anything at all while we were following him. With nowhere else to turn, I know you did it. Bunton brings Watts in for questioning Everybody. and tries to get him to crack. Man, I didn't do nothing. I spent several hours in a room with him, talking with him, uh, trying to get him to, uh, to confess. And he continued to talk to me. And that was very surprising to me. At one point, told him, Coral, I even know how you did it. And I put my arm around his neck. And I held him, and then I simulated the stabbing. And I said, you did it just like this, Coral, just like this. And he kind of went limp in my hands, you know? And he looked like he was going to cry, even. And that's when he said he wanted to talk to his mother. After that, Watts refuses to talk, and Bunton has no choice but to let him go. But even after the surveillance is officially called off, the detective won't give up. I would wake up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and get dressed, strap my gun on, and go out and get in the car and drive. Just look around. You can't help but to get obsessed. You have three dead young ladies. These kind of murderers often think they're smarter than the police, and they play cat and mouse games. He left very few clues, which shows that he was very organized. He approached the task in a logical and coherent fashion, and so we had to convince him that the game was up. We knew where he went. He, he kind of lived a routine life and I would already be there. 
when he'd go to the grocery store, I would be coming out as he walked in and I'd say hi to him. When he went to school, I'd be in the parking lot. He was going to diesel mechanic school. We wanted Watts to know that we knew, and we wanted to flush him out, make him careless, or in this case, make him paranoid. He was in Ann Arbor, and he was at the county building, the courthouse. He was on the telephone when I saw him, and I walked up to him and said, hi, Carl, can we go back to the office and talk? And he dropped the telephone and ran. If he thought he was being watched all the time, he wouldn't be out killing people. And I was under the impression at that point that he was quite a killing machine. Detective Paul Bunton has been trailing Coral Watts for months. Then suddenly he seems to vanish. Bunton goes to the transport company where Watts worked. They said, oh yeah, he left a forwarding address. He's in Houston, Texas. Bunton immediately calls Houston police. He advised me that they had what they thought was a serial killer in Texas at this time that had been up in Ann Arbor, Michigan for some time that had killed a lot of women. He explained to me what his MO or method of operation was up there, methods of surveillance that they had used to attempt to catch him. He also explained that he rarely, if ever, left any kind of evidence at these scenes. I had contact with Doug Bostock, uh, oh geez, a couple times a week from that point on. In 1981, Houston was a city that was rapidly growing. So was its crime rate. We were going through the throes of some very high murder rates. We had several years that we were investigating over 700 murders a year here in Houston. Doug Bostock is assigned to track down Coral Watts. After weeks of searching, Houston police locate Watts's Pontiac at the Houston Metro Garage, where he works as a mechanic. Police attach a tracking device to his car. Just as in Ann Arbor, police follow Watts around the clock, but nothing happens. We attempted to follow him, keep track of him through work, through his residence. We had people in the homicide division pulling up cases of women that were killed in the method that was used up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Since the time that Watts arrived in Houston, there have been dozens of unsolved murders. Young women who've been stabbed, strangled, even drowned. But without any tangible evidence, Houston police can't tie any of the crimes to Watts. He was suspect, but he was not charged in any way, and we had nothing that we could put on him here. After 10 months of tailing Watts, police decide to call off the surveillance. With the heat off his back, the serial killer goes on the prowl again. I was just driving to my apartment. I wanted to go home and either have breakfast with Melinda or take a nap, whatever we chose to do before we went to church that morning. You had to go inside the courtyard to go to the stairway. And somebody came up behind me and grabbed my throat really, really tight and it scared me but I was able to scream a little bit. Then he tightened his hold so much tighter that I just started blacking out immediately. At that time, I just knew I was gonna die. That's the only thing that came across and I was blacking out. Watts walks upstairs to the apartment with Lori's keys. Me 
immediately I noticed his eyes. They were very evil and cold looking. I was in shock. He was in shock. I wasn't expecting to see him. He wasn't expecting to see me. I knew that he was there to, you know, to hurt or kill. <laughs> he came behind me, put the knife to me. Um, he, he had his arm around me, so he was choking me, and I couldn't breathe. When he put the knife to me, he said that he would kill me if I screamed. I just said, okay. His arm got a little tighter on me to where I couldn't breathe, so I had to pretend to pass out. body hitting the steps as he was dragging her up. When she came in, I could see him dragging Lori into the bathroom. I could hear her moaning, so I knew that she was not in any kind of condition to get away or anything. grabbing the hangers and, and taking them apart to tie you up and stuff. He did everything so quick, so I knew that he had done it before. I don't want to move because, you know, I'm pretending to be passed out the whole time. <laughs> there were times where he made uh, sounds, like sounds of excitement. <laughs> After he checked on me, he started the bath water. I was thinking if he took me in there, there was no way that we were going to um, get out of there alive. stood up and went to the door and locked the bedroom door as quietly as I could. My intentions were to um, jump over the balcony and go get help. I didn't know how I was going to jump off the balcony with my hands tied, but I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? landed on my knees, thank God, um, and I ran to the left. There was a woman sitting outside her patio drinking coffee, and I ran to her and told her someone's trying to kill my roommate. She needs to call the police. After that, I don't know what happened. Watts tries to flee, but it's too late. Police! Do not move. Get your hands up. Put your hands on your head and turn around. Follow my commands. Interlace your fingers. A neighbor finds Lori in the bathtub and resuscitates her. I was so grateful that the girls had survived. Don't think about it. Get down. Do as I say right now. I saw no remorse whatsoever. Not the slightest bit of remorse on what he had done, much less being caught. Coral Watts is charged with attempted murder. I was ecstatic. And we finally had him in custody, and it looked like two very good cases on him. It seems that Coral Watts' game of cat and mouse has finally come to an end. The 
killer's been caught, but keeping him locked up will be a lot tougher than investigators ever imagined. A 28-year-old bus mechanic was in court today pleading guilty on an unrelated burglary. Coral Watts' arrest hits the evening news. Detective Bunton flies into Houston to meet with Watts. I said, you know what I'm down here for? I need to talk to you about Ann Arbor's cases. And he says, I'm not going to talk to you. He says, I need to see an attorney. And so we were done talking to him. Meanwhile, the Houston police believe that Coral Watts could be responsible for dozens of unsolved murders. I spoke with him yesterday morning and, and told him now was the opportunity to get his life straight and to help these people bury their dead. The prosecutor's office offers Watts a controversial deal. In exchange for a guilty plea in the Lori Lister case, and a 60-year sentence, Watts will confess to a number of Houston's unsolved murders and be granted immunity for those crimes. I hated to see any deal made on a man who's killed so many people, but we didn't have proof of these deaths. All we had was the two attempted murders. We still had no proof up in Ann Arbor or any other place. I got a call at my home from Doug Bostock again that said, he will confess to your three murders if you come down here with a grant of immunity. This was a Sunday, and we all went to the station and met and discussed it, and we all agreed that we weren't going to give a grant of immunity on a homicide case. Police had been told a body was buried along the banks of White Oaks Bayou. With the deal in Houston signed, Watts gives homicide detectives Tom and Jimmy Ladd the first glimpse into his secret life. We never realized that Watts buried any of his victims. So when he gave us the first body that was buried, her name was Suzanne Searles, we went out there. He said, OK, dig right there. And we did, and we excavated her grave. Carrie Mae Jefferson had also disappeared as she was returning home from work. Watts takes the detectives to her gravesite. Generally in this vicinity right here is this side of the bayou and up from the waters where he had dug the, dug the grave for Carrie Jefferson. Coral was very stoic in his demeanor and he just pointed out, you know, the area where he thought he buried her. And it's just like we'd talk about how hot the weather was. Investigators press Watts for more information. He started telling us about other cases, too, and I think, you know, within about 30 or 45 minutes or so, we'd identified seven or eight Houston murders that he was talking about and knew that he'd committed because we'd been studying all these cases and had it charted them and everything. And so, you know, we knew he was telling the truth. It's going to be bad. Yeah, we can't speculate on any number, but this has got a bad start. Back at police headquarters, Watts divulges details of more murders. It was amazing how he, he never got the details of one case mixed up with the other. All right, what time of the day or the night? She said, I killed a girl, left her beside a dumpster over, you know, on such and such a street. And of course, as soon as we heard dumpster girl in the street, and, you know, we knew what Casey was talking about. That was 20-year-old Elena Samander. Told us he strangled a girl, he was like he hit Margaret Fossey in the throat and, you know, crushed her larynx. 25-year-old Elizabeth Montgomery was stabbed in the heart. And she was able to stumble away and go to her apartment. Of course, the wound was mortal, and you know she was dead before they get paramedics there. And then a couple hours later, he killed Susan Wool. 
He saw her leaving a grocery store. He followed her home as she was approaching her apartment with bags of groceries, multiple stab wounds. I think he stabbed her seven or eight times. On this same night, the woman got killed with walking her dog. Was there another one that happened that same night? Yes. Sometimes, Watts attacked more than once in a day. 20-year-old Michelle Madej was drowned in her bathtub. Only hours before Watts tried to kill Lori Lister. We knew he drove around all night long, every night. We were trying to figure out what triggered him to pick a certain victim. And so we just asked him. A right killer. Well, we knew that was a bunch of bull because most of his victims were two, two, three o'clock in the morning or later. He couldn't see their eyes, and a lot of them he would follow in their car. In my mind, I think he just drives around until the little bomb goes off in his head. And when it does, he just picks out a victim. And there were more confessions. Phyllis Tam was choked. Her body hung from a tree. Emily Lacroix, just 14, was on her way to her waitressing job when she was strangled. Anna Lede was stabbed after attending a party in her honor. Linda Tilly was attacked and then drowned in her apartment swimming pool. And Yolanda Gracia was stabbed to death on her own front lawn. In all, Watts confesses to 13 murders. The common thread in the Watts case is that all of his killings were fueled by fantasy. He killed thousands of times in his mind. He rehearsed these killings, and then he went out to find someone who fit his psychological profile. When I was working on the story, I would drive around to all the places where bodies had been found, and you just get this sense of the vastness of the city and how he just was a predator on the freeways. He was just like a shark trolling for prey. As the depth of Watts' depravity is revealed, controversy grows over the immunity deal. It's not something I would have done. Uh, I just can't see myself doing that. What they don't understand is every one of these cases that Watts confessed to, there was no witnesses, there was no evidence. And if Watts hadn't confessed to them, they'd still be in the uncleared status. And, and family members would be wondering, you know, who did it and why and whatever. Watts dehumanized his victims. They were no more important to him than a piece of discarded paper. He had no emotional connection to the rest of the world around him. Now, people say anybody who does that has to be crazy. Coral Watts was not mad. He was bad. Three years after witnessing the murder of Helen Dutcher, Joe Foy sees Watts on TV. I had the volume down and the stereo on, and I was just watching the picture, and uh, I seen a black man being led into a courtroom, and as soon as they walked him through the door, I just, oh my God, that's the man that killed that woman in Ferndale. Once again, Foy contacts Ferndale police. I called them numerous times, aren't you guys going to do anything about this? Aren't you guys going to do anything about this? And it was always, no, we're satisfied. No, we're satisfied. And the very last phone call I got was, Mr. Foy, put it to bed. Just put it to bed. In September 1982, a judge rules the bathwater in Lori Lister's case is considered a deadly weapon and sentences Coral Watts to 60 years in prison for attempted murder. Into the penitentiary, they'll have to pipe somebody into you. And that you 
Do you think justice has been served? No, of course not. Limited justice? Yeah. Limited. I just felt like I was furious. I felt it was unfair and unjust. But for Houston prosecutors, it was the best possible outcome. They had cleared 13 unsolved murders and taken a serial killer off the streets. It would appear that Coral Watts would never kill again. Confessing to 13 murders, Coral Watts is sent away to a Texas penitentiary for what seems like a life sentence. If he survives his 60 years behind bars, he'll be 88 years old when he gets out. A serial killer is off the streets, but investigators can't help but wonder what secrets are locked away with him. I said to him, Coral, I haven't got enough fingers and toes to count the amount of people you have killed. And he looked around and said, there are not enough fingers and toes in this room. And there were four of us in the room. Years went by. He goes into prison. Everybody just kind of dropped it, forgot about it. He's not really written about much for 15 years but then harriet samander mother of one of the victims makes a frightening discovery i found out that he was up for parole he was classified non-violent so he was in the parole system she alerts andy khan the mayor's crime victim director in Houston, who calls the prison. I called Harriet back and I said, parole is the least of your problems. Under Texas law, he must be released somewhere around the year 2006, no ifs, ands, or buts. In 1987, Watts had appealed the deadly weapons charge against him, saying it was never part of his plea bargain. The court ruled in his favor, and his status was changed to a non-violent offender. We had a law that was crafted to alleviate overcrowding in prison called the mandatory release law. That made Watts eligible for good time credits, which would only expedite his release. Basically, he was achieving good time at a rate of three days for every day served. He would have served 24 flat calendar years which is actually less than two years for every Houston area homicide victim that he murdered. I knew nothing about good time. Oh, that was a shock to learn about good time. That you just wake up in the morning, you get three days taken off your sentence every day. We wanted the governor's office to form a committee of the best legal minds of this state and see if there was any other possible solution other than release. But we couldn't get anywhere. We were, do, we were just barking and barking, and everybody pretty much told us that, uh, too bad, he's coming out. There's nothing you can do about it. Furious, Harriet Samander launches a campaign to abolish the mandatory release law. She succeeds, but it's a hollow victory. They couldn't make the law retroactive to uh, include the Watts case, so it didn't change anything for me. With Watts's release now definite, Harriet Samander and Andy Kahn organize a memorial and call to action in 2002. It's so my honor to be up here and see that uh, we remember the families. We couldn't believe it. Families of the victims came from uh, Boston, from Washington State, Colorado, Ohio. We, we were just stunned. After we did the memorial ceremony and call to action, it, things just spiraled media-wise. It, it got picked up by the Associated Press. 
and I got contacted by uh, Donna Pendergast at that time with the uh, Michigan Attorney General's office. And apparently Michigan, like most people in the country, was unaware that Carol Eugene Watts was going to be released. If you're going to enter into a plea bargain, you have to have your T's crossed and your I's dotted. And when I realized how it all evolved and, and how it ended up that he was in this position where he was scheduled for release, it was really horrifying. But there's still one last chance to keep Watts off the streets. Try him on another murder case. The state of Michigan picks up the ball and begins searching their files for any unsolved case that could be tied to Watts. We looked at primarily stabbings and strangulations. If there was evidence that would be suitable for testing for uh, DNA or other type of evidence that uh, could link the case to a suspect, then we submitted the evidence to the lab. We kept getting calls from Texas, Andy Kahn kept calling and saying, have you come up with anything yet? And it was always, we're still looking, Andy, we're still looking. But pressure was building because obviously the day release date was getting closer. Then, in January 2004, two years before Watts is scheduled to be released, Michigan's Attorney General Mike Cox appeals to the public for any information about Coral Watts's crimes. What we're trying to do here in Michigan is do all we can to make sure that when May 8, 2006 comes along, that we have a charge to serve him with. Very quickly, where should people call if they have any information they think is relevant? I'm sitting there, you idiots. What about the Ferndale murder? How come you guys aren't calling me on the Ferndale murder? Joe Foy calls the Michigan Attorney General's office. And finally, someone listens to him. He was lucid, he was coherent, and he seemed to know what he was talking about. I called Lieutenant Hanger back immediately and said, he's not a wacko, Bill. Um, I think we've got something here. Foy's testimony and composite sketch are just what the state needs. I'm directing my prosecutors to swear out a warrant this afternoon charging Coral Eugene Watts with premeditated first-degree murder for the brutal killing of Helen May Dutcher. No Hollywood writer could have ever dreamed this scenario up. No way in the world. It had to be divine intervention. Somebody was actually out looking for the good guys for once. 